the last part of this lecture is on sensing and sensors and data acquisition. How does it actually get into your computer? And I'll just give you a quick tour of some of the sensor designs that are in use today and that you would probably use if you use if you build a BCI. So um, most EEG systems that are on the market are still based on electrode gel, conductive gel. It's some kind of a salty um, thing uh, or electrolyte uh, solution. And so here's a so-called passive electrode. It's just a metal ring. Um, and you, you put it on the cap, and you squeeze some gel in there, uh, and that makes a good contact. It doesn't have an amplifier in it or anything. And then there's active electrodes, which have little amplifiers in there. So in this case, um, the signal is already amplified when it travels through the cable, as opposed to here. So here, you're transporting microvolts through the cable. And so the electromagnetic artifacts are much lower in these kinds of electrodes and also cable sway. And um, you can have, let's say in many cases, you can actually have much worse impedances uh, uh, than basically that's, you know, the resistance in a sense between the, the electron and the skin than you would have with, with passive electrons. So um, you usually in most advanced systems have these kinds of electrodes nowadays. There's also these so-called dry electrodes. Um, they look less comfortable than they actually are. <laughs> so um, these are there's the so-called pin-based design. Many of them are like that. So um, it's basically the pins that you kind of um, that are in the cap, and when you put it on, it gets through the hair. That's the critical part. It needs to get through the hair. They have rounded tips, so um, that's why it doesn't hurt. And also, they distribute the force over multiple pins. Usually it's enough if just one or two or three or so of these pins make contact. You don't have to have all of them making contact. Here's another design. These actually have little springs in there, so they're spring-loaded from, from our Taiwanese colleagues. And then you have different, you also have sites where there's no hair, like the forehead, and there you can use completely different sensors, like these foam-based ones. It's conductive wiring or whatever on foam. And there's some even newer sensors. There's so-called bristle sensors, which are little bristles, like a toothbrush, um, which have a much higher chance of getting through the hair, although it can be a little bit itchy uh, after a while. And here's a prototype design um, that made a big splash in, in the news. That's so-called epidermal electronics. So that's a whole circuit uh, printed on some tattoo-like, uh, you know, kind of fake tattoo-like base and you can put it on your skin and it stays there for a while and it deforms with your skin and so on. And they can put, you know, coils for power transmission and God knows what on there. So with these designs you can put lots of electrodes down without all the hassle of, of you know, putting it up every day and things like that. Um, when you, once you've measured this signal in an analog fashion, you need to digitize it at some point because you want to do digital processing. And uh, usually what is being done, this is just basic sampling theory, is the signal is being low pass filtered uh, at some frequency, say um, 200 hertz or whatever. And then it's being sampled uh, by a, at a particular time point by a digital circuit. And that gives you a bit code, right, um, that tells you how strong the signal is. And so this is how it turns into a series of numbers, basically. And um, sometimes this is drawn as kind of a step function. And it gives the illusion that, um, that the signal is interpreted as a step function. But we know that it's sort of band limited. We know that we low pass filtered it. And that's why we don't actually interpret it as this kind of stepping thing. So usually, um, there's a certain highest frequency that you want to be able to deal with. And you filter right above that, say. And then you digitize at twice the rate, and you're completely fine. So uh, there's the sampling theorem underlying that, um, right? Uh, that's well known from signal processing and sampling theory, which says that if your signal is band limited below a frequency that's half your sampling rate, so-called Nyquist frequency, so that contains no uh, or, or negligible spectral contents above that, you can exactly reconstruct that signal um, from a sample time series using this interpolation function. Um, and that function is called sync. It's like some kind of a ripple. Um, that is 
just a rule to do it, and there's various approximations to that which still work pretty, pretty well. After you've sampled and digitized it and so on, uh, y you need to get the data to your program, and that is usually, you know, mundane computer technology, right? You have specific recording programs from the, from the producer of the headset, vendor specific, like the Brain Vision Recorder, ActiveView, GTAC Recorder, and so on. You have drivers sometimes, like the Emotive SDK comes with a driver and a little dongle, uh, et cetera. And sometimes, especially the more modern wireless headsets use generic interfaces like Bluetooth. And so with Bluetooth, I have a little Bluetooth transponder here. You can talk to many, many of the modern wireless systems. And uh, other, other systems have a server with TCP network connections and so on. So that is usually the, the smallest problem if you know how to program or if you have the right tools uh, to get the data in. And um, there is one thing to be careful with, and that is some EEG systems don't give you a real-time access. So they have a recording thing, and you get the post hoc recorded data, but you don't get real-time access, so you can't use it for BCIs. But that's mostly with toys and things like that. And that's, uh, that's the end of this lecture, in fact.